Hey everybody, uh, it's Jake here um, with Zach. We wanted to address everything that's been happening um, this past week with uh, the uh, targeted police uh, police lynchings of you know African Americans and Black people across this country, and as well as their targeted harassment and just excessive use of their power and force in these protests and these demonstrations. If you don't know why people are fed up. If you don't know why people don't think that peaceful protests are working, if you don't understand why um, fires are burning, why people are breaking into uh, things, why people are becoming so violent and defensive in response to the way that the police are acting, then I think that you need to educate yourself. And I don't think that that's my responsibility to do that. It's not Zach's responsibility to do that. I don't think it's anyone's responsibility, but your own, because if you're an American citizen, you've lived in this country long enough to realize what's been happening for centuries. And, you know, I think that the quote that has been circulating um, from Martin Luther King is that a riot is the language of the unheard. And, you know, we as a community, not only as a black community, but as our white brothers and sisters as well, stand with us united against tyranny and oppression. We are fed up and we're done. And I think that the more that people realize that, the better off that we'll be. If this upsets people, I'm sorry. Actually, I'm not sorry. If it upsets you, then unfollow us or stop listening to us because this is an issue that is not only systemic, but it's an issue as old as our country's history and we will not be ignored anymore. We will not condone uh, and forget police violence and police lynchings and police murders anymore. And until our demands are met, until we feel that there are legitimate consequences to the actions of this paramilitary terrorist organization, then nothing will get solved. And this will continue. And to the people that are with us in support, we appreciate you. We love you. We need to continue to speak out and speak up against this sort of behavior that it goes unchecked for decades and decades and decades. And, you know, hopefully that when the dust is settled, we'll be looking at a better America and a better future for our children. But it starts today. It started last week. It started 50 years ago, 70 years ago. And we need to keep going. And this is a forever fight. So we need to be aware that this will take a while. But it starts with us and it starts today. Very, very important and powerful stuff. Jake, thank you for sharing that. And I obviously... I am a white person. I have never gone through anything that you have gone through that black people in America have struggled with. And I stand with you. I know that it is not enough to not be racist, but you have to actively be anti-racism. And I think it's important that as white people, we use our privilege to educate ourselves, to educate others, to advocate for your causes, for, to, for equality, for for everyone and that there's there's so much that we can do to be to, to advocate to help and if you aren't taking advantage of that opportunity of that privilege then you're wrong and Jake if there's anything that you would like I know you said it's not your responsibility to educate people and it's not but if there's anything that you would like to suggest that our our white audience, our white listeners, that those people can do, what can we do to help? For, you know, the white listeners, for our our white supporters. And I do think that, you know, that this revolution, that this, um, that these demonstrations will not work and will not be successful without the help and support from our white brothers and sisters, our Latino brothers and sisters, our Asian brothers and sisters, people from all walks of life that come and support the advancement of black people. And when we talk about the advancement of black people, that must mean the advancement for all black people, including our members of the LGBTQ community. And I think that for our white listeners that don't necessarily know what to do and want to know, that the first thing that you can do is understand your privilege like Zach has and use it to benefit 
people that don't that aren't in that spaces that don't have that privilege. And I think that starts by having those hard conversations to call out people that you know that are racist, that use the N word in rap songs, that consistently disregard the values and beliefs and really livelihoods of the black people in this country. And I think that we need to be more vocal about our support, um, not only uh, against people that have been murdered, but the people that are protesting. And I think that, you know, there are, there are many ways that you can do that. You need to have, you need to educate your children more. You need to teach them about not just the March on Washington, Washington, but you need to teach them about slavery. You need to teach them about what happened during the Jim Crow era. You need to teach them about lynchings. You need to teach them about, about um, the four black girls that were bombed in a church in 1960. You need to teach them about police brutality from circulating all the way when they were the runaway slave patrol to Rodney King riots in 1992 to now. Only then can we really move forward. And I think that actionable change is that you need to vote and not only in the presidential election, but we need to come back in 2022 and we need to vote in local elections because local elections are the one that are the elections that directly affect community policing. They, if we have DAs that will try and convict officers that murder uh, unarmed black people, then the next time one of those thugs tries to murder and another one, they will see their brother in arm that is in prison because of what he did and they will hesitate and that hesitate will lead to, to the disruption of the system that has been pervasive for so long. Local elections are extremely important. And I think that if we want to see actionable change, it starts there. Also, I think we need to put pressure on um, the police. I think that while not all cops are bad, it seems like most of them are silent and silence in times of oppression means com uh, that you are complicit. And I think we need to put pressure on those good officers that we've all met, that we've all interacted with to hold their brothers accountable. And we need to make it more difficult to become a police office, uh, officer in this country. I completely agree, echo, support all of those sentiments. Jake, again, thank you so much for sharing such an important message that hopefully people have listened to. And if that's not what you want to hear, then like Jake said, you have no business following inside the film room, following either of us, listening to our podcast, because that's what we stand for. To infinity and beyond! This is me. This is how I win. Were you rushing or were you dragging? Answer! You're a wizard, Harry. Say what again? Say what again? I dare you. No. I am your father. Hasta la vista, baby. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? kind of hard to to just shift into some significantly less important discussions here but it's kind of what we're going to do i guess yeah it's kind of hard to, it's a hard segue but i think we it can, is you know jake away. jake is the segue king and even he is stumped <laughs> with, with, with that one there so so i guess we should just just get get right to it you today right like to it. <laughs> yeah so today, like Jake said, we've got a big episode. We are doing another throwback review for a significantly underrated movie, a movie that just kind of gets lost in the shuffle when it comes to to fiction, to young adult, to, to movies that have been adapted from literature, and that is Catching Fire, the second Hunger Games movie. And in honor of that, we're doing our top five book-to-movie adaptations but before we get started with all that stuff, just other than what we've already discussed, Jake, how have you been this past week since we last spoke? Well, in uh, movie news, I think that I've I've been uh, trying to update my letterbox. Uh, uh, I've like been retroactively going back and trying to remember every movie I've ever seen ever. Um, <laughs> get those numbers them. up. Exactly. Yeah, it's a competition. Um, but what was the last 
movie I watched. I rewatched Black Klansman, um, which was Very much better. It was much better than I remember. Um, I mean, I loved it when I came out, but I didn't remember being like it it being as good as it was. Um, and coming around the second time was really good. I also rewatched Bad Education, uh, which is on HBO, um, which is uh, Hugh Jackman and Allison Janney about uh, kind of like a an underlying uh, teaching scandal in uh, Long Island, which uh, is just phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's, that's a great film. And I was glad it's kind of like one of the hidden gems that uh, kind of got swept away with all the coronavirus stuff, but uh, it's on HBO. If you want to check it out. Have you been diving into HBO max? Yeah, I've been, I've been like, um, kind of like every day, like just scrolling through the TCM list and like marking stuff that I want to watch as we kind of go forward. I genuinely think that I spend more time on HBO Max and just every streaming app adding movies to my list than I do actually watching any movies. Yeah, exactly. Especially with HBO Max, just the the sheer range of that catalog. I've been so I watched the first I watched The Fellowship of the Ring, the first Lord of the Rings movie finally. Finally. Got got through that no thoughts yet because Next week we will be doing. It's my mission this week to watch the the second and third movies, so that next week we can do an entire trilogy review. So I'm not going to say anything about that. But I've also I watched Tropic Thunder, rewatched that. It was the first time that I'd seen that probably since I think I'd only seen it once, like when it came out back in like '08 or whatever that was. How did that but hold up? The I, you've seen it, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. It's. I mean, I think. I don't think it would be made in 2020. But yeah, for I think sure. it, like, But I think because of like the way that it's like satirizing things that it does hold up. Like, what is your opinion on that? Um, I've like, I've rewatched it. And I think the first time it is just like unbelievably hilarious. Um, right. This is, then, I would like, say this is essentially my first time watching it because I was like 11 or whatever when, yeah, yeah, when it actually sure. came out, you know? So this is like the first time where I've watched it and really been able to, understand stuff other than the explosions yeah because it is it is like just one of those shocking movies you know where you watch it and you're like holy <laughs> like you know you you're so surprised um that this was even made in 2009 much less uh could it be made now but i mean i think it's a very smart uh film i think it like it 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 is very satirical and i think it's like viciously satirical and uh to the point where it's almost making like you know political statements um, I'm the dude playing the dude. Yeah, Sky yeah. is another dude. Uh, but there are some like iconic scenes in *Tropic Thunder*. I mean, um, my favorite scene is when uh, they're they're walking around and they get to the river and they're <laughs> he says, "We lost, man. We super lost." <laughs> and then, uh, hey, what, what do you mean, you people? <laughs> yeah. What do you mean, you people? <laughs> and they're arguing about the map, and then uh, what he's like a. Uh, you remember, you remember Rocky and, and uh, Rambo too when he came back all jacked? That's what you look like right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, I love that movie. Yeah, it's I, I, I going back. I guess it was probably this past spring when we did the Matthew McConaughey like top five performances. Oh, yeah. I wish I, I, I because this didn't even register with me, but his uh, as as Tug's agent. It's his, his performance is incredible. Oh, He's so funny. So that would definitely retroactively would have made my list. But and then Tom I've Cruise also, too. Oh yeah, Tom, like who? That's just an iconic. I don't know if you'd consider that a cameo or like a supporting role, but it's just so out of the the ordinary. Like Tom Cruise. Yeah. <laughs> I also watched. Have you seen the movie Body Heat? I have not. It's from the 80s. It's Lawrence Kasdan wrote it. So Empire Strikes Back, Indiana Jones, like, you know, the the strong resume there. But this is like one of my parents, they were like, oh, we have to watch this. This is a classic. They've been begging to watch it. And it was on HBO Max. So finally gave in. But it was it's like the original Gone Girl, I would say. It's like this scheming noir, like murder mystery kind of thing. And it's I would recommend that. It's It's a good one. Very, very twisty. Gotcha. But yeah, I've been like you. I've been diving into HBO Max pretty much every late oh, afternoon and, and night. I, say that. I just uh, I just watched Dog Day Afternoon for the first time, um, which is just like utterly phenomenal. 
Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it. I have not. Uh, no. It's I, th- I think it's like Al Pacino's probably his best performance ever. Um, I think it's. You mean Al, pa- Al Pacino? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a Tropic Thunder episode. Um, yeah, I mean, but th- no, dog, and it, it it features one of like the most iconic scenes in film as well, uh, when Al Pacino is like running around the street screaming Attica. Uh, but that is I, that that's a movie that's very palpable for today too. I mean, I was shocked by how well it holds up considering it came out in 1975. Um, but yeah, I mean that that is that instantly became kind of one of the one of the best films that I've seen for the first time this year. So. Another one to add to the HBO watch list. It's just never ending. Oh, I watched, um, th- we could go on for like probably 45 minutes just saying, oh, I watched this, I watched that. Yeah, yeah. Um, But I also watched The Killing Joke, the Batman. Oh, yeah. But that, like, I, I thought that that was supposed to be like the most incredible Batman movie ever or something. But then I looked up afterwards and it had like middle of the road kind of reviews. So I, I had the wrong expectations going in, but I was, no. I was middle- yeah, so if with the Killing Joke, they made like some very weird choices with the movie adaption. Um, but the the com- the graphic novel is one of the best ever. Uh, yeah, I mean, I will say that Mark Hamill's Joker was great. Like, yeah. loved loved that take. But as a whole, I wasn't. I had the wrong impression going in of like what to expect in the level of greatness. But I've also got some of the other. Like the, what is it? The Dark Knight Returns, the part one and part two, I think. I have those on my watch list that I'm going to get into as well. So I would say the greatest animated Batman film. And also, honestly, like one of the top three greatest Batman films ever is Batman Under the Red Hood. Um, I I don't know if it's on HBO Max. I think it should be because it, it, it is just like astonishing how like brilliant it is. And it features some like of the best, voice acting i've ever heard in my life regardless of um any genre so if it's on hbo i'd definitely watch that before you'd watch anything else got it adding it to the list shall we break away from our hbo max watch lists and get into a little bit of news let's go so we don't have too much this week but we're going to start off with some some leonardo dicaprio updates we've got two things regarding leo first up the fact that he it was announced that He's in talks to co-star with Jennifer Lawrence and Adam McKay's upcoming end of the world comedy. Don't look up. I believe this is a Netflix film, but I mean, that's when we're talking with Josh and Johnny, someone pointed out that it's Leo's first straight up comedy role. But I mean, we are, we would argue that once upon a time in Hollywood is pretty comedic, but I think this is just a different genre of comedy. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, him in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is just like one of one of the funniest roles I've ever seen in my life, and like one of the like most consistently funny, you know, because I think that for it being as long of a film it is, I think that it really kind of is paced really quickly, and I think that we have to attribute uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's performance as ushering um, or making the film that uh, as enjoyable as it was. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, when you talk about Adam McKay, that's a guy who's got Anchorman, Step Brothers, the other guys, like basically all of the Will Ferrell movies, Talladega Nights. Like if he's going back to obviously he's been with like the big short and vice and those kind of more political comedy, real real stories recently. And he's doing with Jennifer Lawrence, the Bad Blood, the Theranos movie as well. Mm -hmm. But so, I mean, it depends on what take but this just the fact that this is an end of the world comedy that's giving me serious like throwback Adam McKay vibes so I don't know it'll be interesting to see how Leo handles that type of acting that we've never really seen from him before but we know based on once once upon a time that he has the capacity to be absolutely hilarious yeah no absolutely um also news for Leonardo DiCaprio who's got a busy news slate this week uh Leonardo DiCaprio, De Niro, and Scorsese are teaming up with Apple to distribute, or it's Apple and Paramount to distribute uh, Scorsese's new film, Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, Paramount will handle the theatrical distribution, and they're partnering with Apple, I'm sure, to kind of get the $200 plus million budget that uh, Scorsese is asking to make the film. 
So this is based on the book, Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI, which is a mystery about a series of murders of wealthy Osage Native Americans in Oklahoma during the early 1920s after oil deposits were discovered beneath their land. The ensuing investigation established the FBI and was a pivotal moment in the evolution of America from its frontier era. So that sounds a little more up Leonardo's traditional wheelhouse. And of course, with Scorsese and De Niro as well. I mean, that's something that it's really Apple's first big foray into movies, I would say, like with their own like exclusive content. Absolutely. I, they, they've been getting a lot of rave reviews for their shows on the Apple Plus um, streaming service. I haven't checked any of them out, but, you know, every time I. I look, yeah, every time I look one up, um, it seems that uh, critics love it and people love them. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's the next big step for them is obviously they've established that and gotten their TV going, but to keep up with Netflix or Disney or Hulu or any of these other sites that are creating their own in-house films as well. I mean, especially if you're able to buy it basically from somebody else outside, it's not like from the ground up within Apple, but I know I've seen a lot of people campaigning just like rumors that, the next move for Apple would be to buy a 24 or something like that. That would, Mm -hmm. that's how they would really just take their, their production to the next level. So, I mean, obviously that's not happened yet, but just something to, to potentially keep an eye out for. For sure. And something else to keep an eye out for, uh, Henry Cavill will be back as Superman. Now this won't be a standalone movie, likely a cameo in Shazam 2, Black Adam or Aquaman 2. Um, but this is exciting news. I think that uh, Henry Cavill were, um, did really the best he could, and I think that he's the best Superman um, of the modern era. Of course, Christopher Reeve, um, I think, is still you know the best Superman, but Henry Cavill did as well of a job as anyone could do under uh, the situations that he was put under. Uh, so I'm excited to check this out. Yeah, I still have, it's not on HBO Max, so I haven't checked it out yet, but I've yet to see Man of Steel. So I don't know what he was like in that movie where it was just him. I've seen him in Justice League and in Batman vs. Superman. So, but I'm not nearly as like involved in the DCEU as you are just with your DC fandom in general. Mm -hmm. So I don't really have much sway one way or another here. But I mean, I just hope that he doesn't have to get a mustache CGI'd off yeah (laughs) but hopefully we'll make that work but i mean he we i like him in fallout i I like him as a an actor in general so i mean hopefully he'll get a healthy work environment a proper director proper like all, all of that without any kind of obstacles to to try and manage while actually giving a a superman performance as well so i mean i'm i'm willing to to let that happen you know i'm not opposed of that but We've also got another big return to the superhero universe. As we saw at the end of Spider-Man Far From Home, J.K. Simmons returned as J. Jonah Jameson. Now, was that just a cameo, a one-time thing? No. He is now signed on to return for multiple Spider-Man movies as the (laughs) InfoWars-esque TV reporter, (laughs) newspaper mogul. That is his new, that's how they've pivoted J.K. Simmons in the new Spider-Man universe. Jake, what's your initial reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, I know that you and I both love Whiplash. um, And I think that J.K. Simmons is a phenomenal actor. And also, I thought he was one of the brightest spots of uh, the original Spider-Man trilogy. Uh, It seemed like every line he had was just like unbelievably funny or unbelievably... um, just hysterical and uh, he's a talented actor and i think that having his over-the-top presence return in the mcu would be um something that would be really exciting where is the spider-man i can't even do it i can't even do it it's not doesn't do him justice no, just kinda, no, I don't, we gotta let him do it yeah i just they kind of slipped out i apologize i just wanted to try <laughs> it sounded better in my head so final piece of news for anyone who knows us, you know that we are Invisible Man stands for the Universal Monster Universe, and we're getting another installment. News this week that the Goss God himself, Ryan Gosling, will star in Universal's Wolfman film that is coming soon. 
to production, but this is a pitch that Ryan Gosling made himself basically to, to throw this out there to Universal. It'll be written by, or it is written by, Orange is the New Black writers, Lauren Shucker Blum and Rebecca Angelo. So there's no director yet. Universal's been meeting with some people and it seems like a decision could be coming soon, but it's exciting. I, I We love Ryan Gosling. We love the, the direction. We think this universe is heading in after the Invisible Man. So I'm I'm excited. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that uh, Ryan Gosling is one of the most talented and one of the most versatile uh, actors of our generation. I mean, you know, to do a performance like he did in Blade Runner 2049 uh, and then to do something like The Nice Guys or to do something like... Um, La La Land. Yeah, La La Land. I mean, you know, he is he is a phenomenally talented actor. And I think that the what we're hearing about uh, what Universal's Wolfman will look like, I think, is something that will be very, um, very kind of well suited to his strengths. And I think that that's very cool that he was the one that kind of developed the pitch himself um, and him having kind of a personal stake in the matter will only help to uh, make the film better. Right. And what we're hearing, it's not confirmed yet by any means, but there's rumors that this is believed to be set in present times, which if you're going off of what the mummy looked like or what Invisible Man looked like, that would make sense. But it's going to be in the same vein as Jake Gyllenhaal's Nightcrawler, another movie that we both love, that obviously would have a supernatural twist with a, a werewolf involved. So, But that same sort of like film noir almost like investigative just thriller vibe and i believe i read somewhere that it will and also like like we said this is not confirmed but uh it sounded like that ryan gosling will be uh, a news anchor that gets infected and that it will also have a network um vibe as well network being uh, one of the great films from sydney lumet uh that dealt with like one of the craziest uh, news anchors ever to be put on a silver screen. So definitely something to keep our eye out for. Definitely. That is it for news. It's time to get down to business here with our throwback review. We're talking Catching Fire, the second installment in the Hunger Games series. This is the 75th year of the Hunger Games. The tributes are to be reaped from the existing pool of victors. I get to say goodbye. So what do we do? I don't think these games are going to be different. The 75th Hunger Games! Ready to work? There she is, Kansas 17! The girl on fire! you guys to forget everything you think you know about the games last year was child's play this year you're dealing with all experienced killers any last advice stay alive jake catching fire this is one that we have talked about with me i had just finished reading the hunger games prequel books that kind of had me in the mood and i think it just worked out very well with the timing that I had finished that. You had just happened to rewatch this movie and realized, or I guess re-realized how much it just absolutely slaps. Yeah, so we, I mean, that was an easy pitch for you to, to say, hey, let's do this. And I was fully on board after just finishing that book. So that that's how we got here. That's how we got to Catching Fire. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny because I was trying to find a movie to watch. Uh, and this was a few days ago. And we have like a vast Blu-ray collection at the house. So I was just kind of like um, scrolling through and like tapping and looking through uh, the titles that we had and catching fire just fell. <laughs> like, it literally like, was a sign. It fell, know, fell off the shelf. It just, it just fell off the shelf. Like it could not like have been written any like better. Interstellar in pushing play. books out. Yeah, exactly. Murph. Um, <laughs> but uh it fell and I was like, you know what, we'll just watch this. And I wasn't expecting a lot um, just because I think it's one of those movies that you just don't remember a lot. 
you know, I, you, you know, if you've read it and you've seen it and I think everyone remembers enjoying it, but you know, I think that with four, with a four movie uh, kind of span of saga dealing with the hunger games, it kind of gets lost in the shuffle, uh, which is disappointing because rewatching it, I was, I, I do think it is far and above the best film in the saga. And it is just unbelievably good. I was shocked by how, um, how good it was. Yeah, definitely. I will say there's two other coincidences that kind of coincided with this, that as I was, I I watched it, I I bought it on, on Apple or on Amazon to watch, but it happened to be on Freeform Hunger Games weekend. So a marathon was happening. So I went ahead and recorded Mockingjay one and two, so I could finish out the, my watch of the series. But so that's another coincidence. And then this clip that had been circulating on Twitter was again, kind of another easy decision to to pull the trigger and rewatch this was that it's the scene where Katniss goes from the tube I saw up into the up yeah. into the arena and it's just the you it's the a style of filmmaking that you don't really see in major blockbusters too much i mean you know there's constantly the criticism that like these things like with marvel that they're all just like cookie cutters or something like that or just like that it's too worried on like the content and not like the filmmaking but the way that the the, the aspect ratio, aspect ratio shifts from from like the widescreen to then like yeah, basically like closing her, 178 right i don't i'm not the filmmaker here jake that's you i don't know the <laughs> the the numbers and whatnot but just the the size of the screen expanding and whatnot and i was very disappointed that my amazon purchase did not do that i was so upset yeah, it, it does it on the Blu-ray. I didn't, so I didn't see the clip until I think two days after I had watched it. Um, but I caught it when we were watching the Blu-ray because I was just, I was just like looking um, after Peta gets, or not after Cinna gets Santa. dragged away. Yeah, after Cinna gets dragged away, and I'm looking up at the screen that I'm watching. Also, great performance by Jennifer Lawrence. Like that whole sequence where she has to like reckon with. Cinna being basically murdered in front of her eyes and then having to steal her resolve to for the games is just like incredible but like I was watching mm. it and then I just saw it went up and I was like oh my god did they just do that and I had to re- I uh rewound I rewound it to make sure that I wasn't just dreaming I had seen the clip and then watched the movie and then I was very disappointed when it didn't happen on my screen so I paused the movie got my phone out watched the clip again <laughs> and then continued with the movie so I could pretend like it happened on the big screen for me but this movie is before we give a little brief synopsis for those that are need a refresher this movie is the highest rated in the Hunger Games series by Jake and I and by people at large it's got a 90% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes and an 89% audience score, which that's, I feel like that's rare with blockbusters, with big franchise movies, tentpole movies, whatnot, whatever you want to call it, that they're so highly regarded by critics and fans alike, whether it's like a divide in the fan bases of just not really appreciating the, or not enjoying the adaptation or just like critics saying that it's just like a cash grab or something like that. But that really says a lot about how this movie how much this movie is respected, even if it's kind of forgotten. Yeah. I mean, you know, it it is, it is one of those uh, films. I mean, like we've kind of talked about a little bit earlier where, uh, and I think it's similar to, at least in my experience, because I I rewatched Unstoppable, the Tony Scott film with uh, Denzel Washington and uh, Chris Pine uh, a few weeks ago. And I was just like, blown away by how good it is and i think that it just kind of had that similar effect where you remember loving it and then you come back to it years later and you do and you just kind of are astounded by the quality of the of the film yeah i i mean this is it's i got here let's let's go with the the synopsis before we get any deeper here just so we don't leave listeners (laughs) questioning what we're talking about but then we'll then we'll get back to it. So Catching Fire, the second Hunger Games movie, begins as Katniss Everdeen, Jennifer Lawrence, has returned home safe after winning the 74th annual Hunger Games alongside fellow tribute Peta Malark, played by Josh Hutcherson. So by winning, it means that they're forced to turn around, leave their families and close friends, and embark on a victor's tour to all of the districts of the people who they have just killed in the arena. 
Along the way, Katniss senses that a rebellion is simmering, but the Capitol is still very much in control as President Snow prepares the 75th annual Hunger Games, which is a quarter quell, and it becomes a competition that could change Pen M forever. Very, very loose description there, not really spoiler territory. But again, this movie is from quite a few years ago, from 2013. So we're going to go ahead and spoil things. But I was about to, what I was about to say before that synopsis is that you kind of forget that the first movie is all basically, here's the world, now we're in the arena. And it's just action, action, action. But this movie, two thirds of it doesn't even take place in the arena. You know, the games aren't happening. It, it's all the the political frustration and turmoil, the spark of the rebellion that's kind of building up before you even. You, and, and I think that that's what's impressive about it is that it's something like that that is still so captivating and as thrilling as anything that you would see in the arena. Yeah, I mean seeing kind of the insurrection and the revolution uh of pan am uh is really thrilling um and even so much so i mean because you're right you we we see them basically on a train or like giving speeches for like the first hour and change and it's more just about politics and more about training and more about um the climate of what pan am is going through since uh the last uh, the 74th hunger games and, you know, it's, it's a very, it's measured filmmaking because I think that they do a really good job of kind of maintaining uh, your interest through understanding like all the moving parts that are going around now. Um, I think that going to the different districts and seeing that a lot of people are starting to, you know, be much more kind of outspoken about, uh, about uh, President Snow's, you know, handling of what's been going on in Pan Am kind of really kind of levies your attention and holds it up until you get to, you know, when the actual action starts. And I think that balance is so impressive here because with the first one, like I said, you've got basically the entire games. It's all action. And then I haven't rewatched it in a while, but I remember not really loving Mocking J Part One because part one is basically all politics but that this one has that perfect blend the the nice balance of of each so that it's not too much of one or the other but they work together perfectly to to kind of balance each other out yeah absolutely and uh it's it's because i watched uh the first hunger games a while back it was in this year but i think it was probably in january february and this just seems like um, not only like thematically, but just in terms of kind of dialogue and uh, premise as well as approach. It's it's like a much more adult film than I remember it as well. I mean, it's mm-hmm. like you're dealing with some seriously, uh, you know, kind of adult and very, uh, you know, multifaceted kind of issues that uh, are really, I mean, kind of watching this film and then seeing what's going on in the country now is is very kind of poignant, you know, and I think that it is right. It it worked. The timing is the timing is not planned. It just happened to the, the, we didn't pick this movie because of the current climate, but it's relevant nonetheless. Absolutely. I, I think that also another point going off, like your idea of it being more adult is that I think along the way, Jennifer Lawrence's performance just absolutely takes it to the next level from being, I mean, she wasn't by any means bad in the first one as Katniss, but I think her just to come into this one. And like you said, in that scene with Cinna, she does it throughout the whole movie though. Like the balance of, of being terrified of being vulnerable, but vulnerable, but also her steely determination, her, like her resolve, her strength to just battle back. And she balances those, the feelings and the the portrayal of them incredibly. I mean, I think that's some of the best acting that you see. And I I guess you'd consider this like a young adult movie or based on a young adult series. I mean, it's better than I would say most things that you see in Harry Potter or in some of these other films, the the other major series that are, are based on young adult fiction. Yeah. And I, I, 
you know, to your point, this film is largely one um, premised upon character. Uh, there are so many interesting characters. I mean, you know, you can go from Jennifer Lawrence with Katniss to Stanley Tucci um, with, you know, his kind of magnetic performance. Uh, what was the guy's name? Caesar Flickerman. Yeah, yeah. To and I will Stanley. say, I will say in the quick aside, in the prequel book, his father is like the same role as the the announcer of the games in like the 10th hunger games. And he's just as like idiotic and flamboyant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, Stanley Tucci's just magnetic performance um, with Caesar, you know, the, I think the quiet reserve nature of Cinna and, you know, kind of the power that he has in his actions, uh, Philip Seymour uh, Hoffman's performance. I mean, he's one of the most talented actors to ever kind of grace a screen and just, there's so many different interesting characters. And I think that they have such a good understanding of the characters from the book that it made it such a successful adaption. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I mean, on top of that, you've got Jeffrey Wright as BT. You've got, Absolutely. I, uh, you've got Fennec O'Dare, like all, basically all of the tributes. I think that's something else that, that works really well here because instead of it being just kids attacking kids like it is in the the first movie with this being the quarter quell it's a pool of returning victors so you've got more developed characters you're able to bring in more more developed actors sam claflin as finnick odair like i said jeffrey wright as bt um just seeing jenna malone as i can't remember as joanna i mean basically all of those that you see team up versus it just being basically Katniss on her own or Peta. Like you, you get to see more, more characters as well. So I think that's just another perk that really makes this one more appealing than, than every, all, all the other ones. And I will say like with this film, particularly, I cannot remember watching. Um, I guess that's not true, but I, I think it's very few times where I'm watching a, a sequel or the second part of a trilogy and I'm so like utterly engrossed in what's happening in the film that when it ends, I'm just shocked that it's, that it's ended. I mean, like uh, when she blows up the dome and when they kind of come back and, you know, it's revealed that Philip Seymour Hoffman is part of the revolution and uh, as well as uh, Finnick O'Dare uh, with Sam Claflin. And then it just kind of like abruptly ends after the conversation mm -hmm. uh, that she has with, um, uh what's his name hamish yeah hamish uh when she uh after it ends kind of abruptly after that conversation and you're just like wow that's it and then i think that's exactly what the second part of the trilogy should do is that right you know, set up the, the the third one exactly and i think that there are few there are very few kind of um sequels that did that to that extent that i've seen so good on good i on saw that. I saw, I was reading um, so some audience reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, and one of them says, not as good as the original, the ending was very unsatisfying. Like, sir, you need to take that up with Suzanne Collins. This is based <laughs> on a book. Yeah. The, movie, the movie can't just change that completely. I remember going off that, like, I remember eighth grade Zach finishing this book reading it and being like oh my gosh how can you end this yeah. what like just being absolutely like it's rare i would say that you have that sort of like reaction to a book versus like a movie or a tv series or something but like to have just like that combination of, of outrage but at the same time like jaw dropping surprise like i was just i, I think that the movie captures that sentiment perfectly from from what the the book's original intent was to then set up for, like you said, the third part. Yeah. And th the pacing of this film is also incredible. I mean, it's a two hour, it's two hours and 26 minutes. And, you know, when you get past really kind of two ten territories, when films that aren't paced well, start to feel really, really lengthy. And, you know, the balance between, I mean, like we said, the balance between, you know, going around the districts and going to the Capitol and then the actual games, um, it's it's just incredibly paced, and it does not feel that long. I mean, it doesn't feel because it really it's it's cut like an hour fifty movie, honestly, and that's what it feels like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think that 
I because I didn't remember it being two twenty six when I, I saw that runtime as I was getting ready to to get started, and I was like, oh, this is a this is a big one. Yeah. <laughs> I had to kind of like usually I have to like kind of mentally prepare myself before anything that's over two hours, basically. Like, so it, it was. But again, like you said, it just kind of flies by, and you don't really notice that at all. And I think that there isn't a moment where it's really that that could have been cut or something like it's or that feels like it needed to be cut. I think it it goes along pretty quickly and seamlessly. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Was there any moments that uh, surprised you that you didn't remember or that you were kind of like uh, just shocked by either what happened or um, kind of the the steps that they took. Cause I, I haven't read this book. Like you said, like I haven't read this book since eighth grade. So all that I had remembered was that the dome blew up um, at the very right, end. So right. Right. I had, I mean, obviously remembered the general premise. I think as a whole, just kind of the, the fact that the first two thirds are outside of the arena. I had forgotten that like, like you, like you, most of what I remembered is the, the clock and the arena and everything that, that goes down in there. So to really, get an hour and a half plus outside of it was kind of a surprise, but a welcome one. And I just think that some of that stuff is the most important parts of the movie, because if you're trying to set up for the third one, where it's all out rebellion and revolution, then you have to spend that time developing the revolts in district 11, district eight, whatever the numbers are of the people that are holding up three fingers and getting murdered because of it. Like that's, I think those and Jennifer Lawrence's reactions as Katniss to those are, like I said earlier, more thrilling or equally as thrilling as any sort of chase sequence in the jungle of the arena. Absolutely. Any final thoughts on catching fire before we move forward? No, I think that uh, just definitely um, check it out. I think it's on Hulu. You can watch it on Hulu with a subscription. You have um, to but... have okay. That's that's what I was gonna do. You have to have the oh, Hulu okay. Hulu TV Plus. Or ah, something. So like you have to have live you. TV through Hulu. So I was disappointed because I thought I'd found a loophole to to be able to check it out, but I had to pull the trigger on on Prime Video and purchase that bad boy. Gotcha. All right. Well, don't do that. But if, <laughs> if you if you're willing to spend three ninety nine, or if you have it sitting on your shelf like I did, then I would definitely. Uh, revisit it yeah for sure and we're going to give you some other books or movies to revisit as well that are based off books we're going with our top five book to movie adaptations this is fiction only i believe fiction only because you know there would just be if we're getting into the autobiographies or or real world stuff really well i guess one of mine is somewhat real world but it's fictionalized a little bit. So I apologize. I'm breaking my own rules, but these are (laughs) the, this is what we're going with. So book to movie adaptations, you can pick, you can use stuff from franchises, but you have to pick an individual movie. So you can't just say hunger games and cover all your bases there again, like usual, not a draft, just a ranking. So there may be a little bit of overlap here. So Jake, I think it's only right that you get things started with your number five. Well, my number five is what we just talked about. So we've talked about it enough. It's <laughs> catching fire. Um, yes. <laughs> I need you to elaborate, sir. Why do you? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, we've already. I don't know. I. I it was I a think joke. That... It was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we're good. No. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I, th- I think we've done it enough. Uh, it is great. Uh, the book is also very good. Um, check it out. Okay, so number five for me, my list, just a warning, my list is a little bit kind of all over the place because I wanted to make sure that my picks were something that I've read. I don't know if you did the same approach, but I I feel like for myself, okay, good. I I feel like for myself, I couldn't justify. So honorable mentions, Gone Girl, Silence of the Lambs, Jaws, The Shining, all of these incredible movies based off books, but I haven't read those books. So I don't feel like I can accurately justify the books as it being a faithful adaptation or a good adaptation of what the source material is without having read that source material so i'm going on strictly stuff that i've read 
So number five for me, Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events, 2004 movie, not the Netflix series. We're throwing it back. Jim Carrey as Count Olaf. Have you seen this movie? I have. Okay, so this is the... It takes the first three books into the movie. And I think that it was a really, really fun adaptation of it. My brother and I, we grew up watching this. And this was back when they made a video game for every movie. So we like had, who who knew there was a Lemony Snicket PlayStation 2 game? But <laughs> it was it's very fun. It's a, it's a nice twist, pretty faithful to all of the the stuff that goes down in the the first three books. And I mean, it's got a pretty, pretty star-studded cast. Timothy Spalls and there is Mr. Poe. Meryl Streep is Aunt Josephine. But it's it's a lot of fun. Very I think this is one of Jim Carrey's best roles, honestly, as Count Olaf, because he's the perfect amount of like sinister but ridiculous at the same time to really bring that character to life. So Lemony Snicket, a series of unfortunate events. I'm very disappointed they didn't get to move forward with a second movie for the next three books, but there you have it, number five. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, my number four is The Martian. Uh, it's it was written in 2011 by Andy Ware, who's kind of having a renaissance of sorts in Hollywood um, with Ryan Gosling also being uh, slated to be in uh, his soon to be released book uh, film adaption. And uh, I read The Martian before the film came out. Uh, my I think my dad had read it years before because it came out in 2011 and the film came out in 2015. I believe that my dad had read it uh, years before the film came out. And then I had read it when I heard that they were making one. And it is still to this day, one of my favorite books ever. Um, It is unbelievably funny. It's so well-written. Andy Ware, I think is such a talented uh, novelist. He's such a talented author. And the great news is, is that the Martian is one of those films that is almost as good as the book. I mean, you know, the Martian, I think is a stunning um, film. Uh, which we had also just, I'd also kind of recently rewatched a few weeks ago and it is uh, just wonderful and amazing. And it complements the book in so many ways and complements it so well. Again, one that I have not read, nor have I seen it. So really? I'll at least, wow. I will at least have to check out the movie for that. At least check out the movie. Yeah, it's great. Number four for me, Catching Fire. We already hyped it up. Great adaptation. It works excellently as a movie. It works wonderfully as a book. And together, it's an incredible adaptation of the book to the screen. So not much more to say on that. Suzanne Collins wrote the book. Moving on. Number three. Uh, so my number three is Blade Runner. Now, the original... Um... Now, the original book is Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick, written in 1968, uh, the film adaption in 1982, and subsequently the uh, long-awaited, anticipated sequel of sorts was Blade Runner 2049 in 2017. Uh, but Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, I actually read this and when 2049 uh, was uh, coming out, and I had to read it for my, for my science fiction and film class, and it was one of the books on the list. Uh, and it was, I mean, I think that Philip K. Dick is one of those, uh, writers in science fiction that is like always appreciated for what he did for the genre. But I think in terms of writing, some people hate him, some people love him. I'm in the latter category. I think that do Android dream of electric sheep while very much different from blade runner and very much different from blade runner, uh, 2049. I think that, uh, do Android dream of electric electric sheep is, um, it's a great book uh, and they do take a lot of created liberty, creative liberties with the film adaption, but I do think they keep the central uh, themes of the world um, as kind of close as possible, but great book. One of the greatest movies of all time uh, that my number three pick is uh, do Android stream of election sheep now blade runner. Well, another one that I will have to read and or watch. Because you've seen Blade Runner, Jake. You know this. Oh, oh my god! <laughs> I've I remember because I've asked you if I need to because you guys have gotten on me for not seeing Twenty Forty Nine, and so I remember you asking you if that? I need to. Oh my gosh! I'm not going to watch the <laughs> second one without watching the first one. That's fair. That's fair. Give me a break. <laughs> 
I'm watching the Lord of the Rings, okay? Okay, yeah. Well, one travesty resolved at a time. <laughs> exactly. Number three for me, I'm cheating. I'm going with the TV series, Mindhunter. You haven't seen this, so I can I get not. on you I about have... it. <laughs> I have not. The book is Mindhunter Inside the FBI's Elite Serial Crime Unit by John Douglas, the actual FBI agent who kind of developed the behavioral science unit. The The series on Netflix, David Fincher's project, he's directed a bunch of it. Um, but just an absolute, anyone who likes true crime is, this is the, the best possible show to watch. I mean, it's like a fictionalized version of it. So, I mean, you've got like the real life serial killers, and the real life stats and facts and investigations but a little bit of like dramatization in the characters like it's not based on john douglas there's a fictional detective who's basically the the vessel for john douglas's stories but it's it's some of the it's very dark and grisly and very gritty but i mean i think that it's just a a perfect interpretation of it you get a lot of different anyone who's like into learning about serial killers the you you get to see interviews with a bunch of them the second season mainly focuses on the atlanta child murders the first season is about um a a number of different killers but i mean sorry i i had to go from the the books to the or from the movies to the tv series but i had to make an exception here because that is one that I've read and watched that I had to to give a shout out to. Fair. It's, it's on Netflix, isn't it? It is. It's a Netflix original. So I'll go watch Blade Runner and you can go watch Mindhunter. Fair, fair. Uh, my second pick is uh, Jurassic Park. And it was a book written by uh, Michael Crichton in 1990 and then uh, subsequently adapted into a film directed by Sp- Steven Spielberg in 1993. Uh, I still have like a beaten up, brown paper uh copy of jurassic park um it's my parents copy and i remember reading it in high school and you know years after i'd seen the film i think that jurassic park was really one of the first films that i remember watching and then coming back and reading it uh, the book is phenomenal i think michael Crichton is again one of you know one of the most talented uh, writers in science fiction uh and he's been you know, unfortunately, you know, he's, he's passed on, but his work still remains a staple of uh, culture, whether it be Westworld or whether it be Jurassic Park. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, Jurassic Park, I, while I think similarly to Blade Runner, uh, Steven Spielberg takes a lot of creative liberties with, uh, the narrative, but I think that he captures exactly what Michael Crichton was trying to do with Jurassic Park. Um, Jurassic Park is one of the most thrilling books I've ever read. It's one of the most thrilling movies I've ever watched. Um, It's excellent by all accounts, not only in terms of the film, but the movie as well. And uh, that's it. Respect. Respect. Have not read it. Number two for me is something we're all familiar with. I'm fudging the rules here a little bit because it is not one book, but a collective fairy tale world and i'm going with shrek Mm. i didn't even know it it was a book well not not a book it's there's not like a a book or like a collection of short stories but just the correct collection of of the three little pigs and the pied piper and the gingerbread man like all of the characters that make up the world i think seeing the like the amalgamation of all of them and seeing them all come together and it's like easter eggs basically of like knowing all of the stories but seeing how they piece them all together to make something greater uh, a full universe out of it shrek is one of the best animated movies ever it's an incredible incredible tale there should be a book about shrek there should have been but there's not but there are four movies five movies something like that but number one shrek that's well number two on my list shrek number one I think Shrek was a book. I just looked it up. Really? 1990. It's a humorous children's book published in 1990 by American book writer and cartoonist William Stieg about a repugnant and monstrous green creature who leaves home to see the world and ends up saving a uh, princess. Well, there you have it. I did not do my research, I guess. But Jake, (laughs) Jake's covering for me. 
and now it justifies my selection. Although I'm probably, I would assume here that Shrek, the book, does not have all the other fairy tale people in it. It's so. only 30 pages, the book. Yeah, it's like probably one you read in kindergarten, like yeah, your yeah. teacher showed at Show and Tell. So now, it, now I'm, it's official, Shrek number two. There we go. I love Shrek. My number one is Jaws. Um, I have not read this book in a long time. I think the first time I've only read it once. And I think the only time I've ever read it was my freshman year of high school. It was written by Peter Benchley in 1964. I remember it being very confusing. Um, (laughs) I I think I remember liking it for sure. And I'd read it before I'd watched the movie, but I do remember it being very confusing. Um, But Jaws is one of the greatest movies ever made, regardless of genre. Uh, my second Spielberg film to make the list. Uh, it is just breathtaking. I think that it's, I, I think that it's, um, it's definitely like a top two Spielberg film. I think it's my favorite Spielberg film. Um, it was the original blockbuster changed filmmaking forever. Uh, it is one of the most culturally important and significant films ever made. I, there's not really much more to be said, but I did read the book. I just don't remember any of it. Um, so I had to put it <laughs> that one. I can completely respect all of the, the movie statements. I have not read the book, so I can't support those. But I trust you. Number one for me, I don't think it should come as much of a surprise, but Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, I think, although we have discussed many times our favorite Harry Potter movies, and this is not my favorite Harry Potter movie. I think it's an incredible adaptation, putting the world that we read that we read on the page onto the screen. It perfectly. This is basically a word for word adaptation. Like it doesn't leave anything out. It follows the book perfectly, so you really get every single thing that was in J.K. Rowling's original book, and to just see it come to life is incredible. It works as its own movie, as the launching point for the entire franchise, as just an introduction into everything. And I don't think there's much more you could ask for. As a, if, as a fan of the book, as you were anticipating the movie, I think it's everything you could have wanted. There, there isn't anything that's left out, overlooked, anything like that. Very fair. All of the Harry Potter movies are great. All the Harry Potter books are great. I was surprised, I will say. Have you read the Lord of the Rings books? Because... Uh, if so, I not, I I've, I've only read The Hobbit. Um, okay, I've, I've also read not. The Hobbit, but yeah. I I figured if you had read those, they would be on your list. But for sure, I, now yeah, I, I understand mean, I, why. I couldn't I couldn't betray the uh, the code. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. So there you have it: top five book to movie adaptations in parentheses that we've read. So <laughs> that is our list, and that is our episode. Thank you all for listening. Please. Make sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, whatever other social media there is out there at Inside Film Room. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. And tune in next week as I complete my quest through Middle Earth watching these movies. Jake can stop roasting me and we can finally collectively break down the lord of the rings trilogy again thank you all for listening talk to you next time